So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Shanks. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, uh, I am uh, by day an, an archaeologist for the National Park Service. Um, I do a lot of academic work on Robert E. Howard and his works. Um, published a, a few articles here and there over the years. I uh, co-edited a uh, collection of essays on uh, the magazine Weird Tales, which of course Howard Lovecraft and others wrote for, uh, called The Unique Legacy of Weird Tales. Um, and uh, I have for the last uh, several years been the uh, co-chair of uh, Pulp Studies at the Popular Culture Association. And so one of the things we've been really working on in uh, uh, Robert E. Howard studies over the years is getting Howard uh, to have more of a presence in academia. Um, a number of other you know, pulp writers over the years, you know, uh, pulp fiction tends to uh, be relegated somewhat to the, the literary gutter when it comes to academics and always has been, but a number of other um, writers are getting a lot more attention. You know, um, you know, nowadays there's a, a lot more of an understanding from the academic world that popular culture, especially from a cultural studies perspective, is just as important than so-called highbrow uh, literary fiction. And I think you can make an argument that there is actually um, in you know, some of the, the top writers of the pulp fiction world, like Howard and Lovecraft and, and Chandler and Dashiell Hammett and Ray Bradbury, that uh, there are uh, writers there that at least that approach literary quality at times, you know, when they're doing their best work. And so one of the things we've really been trying to do is, is, is get Howard's name into that conversation that has been taking place with some of these other authors, like Lovecraft and Bradbury and Chandler, guys that started out in the pulps, um, but are starting to get more recognition from academics. So uh, beginning in the early 2000s, I believe 2004, is that right, Frank? Uh, the first uh, trip that uh, was 2004, 2004 was the first time that, so yeah, that, yeah. that, that some Howard uh, academics went to the Popular Culture Association uh, Conference. This is the, the big national conference for uh, people studying all aspects of popular culture, uh, books, movies, uh, music, uh, television, uh, comic books. And uh, that was sort of the first foray into it, uh, dipping the toe into the waters, so to speak, a little bit. And um, not a lot came of that for a few years, but then uh, beginning around 2011, 2012, uh, a few of us went back, and it was really just Mark and I, the first year went back to, Mark Finn and I, uh, went back to PCA, and at that point there was a, an attempt to get a, an area there devoted just to the study of pulp fiction and pulp writers. And um, once we uh, presented there, it was, it, was, it was very successful that first year. Uh, the person putting it on asked me to be his co-chair after that, and uh, it started developing from there. We started having more panels on Howard uh, in particular, and uh, we've been uh, publishing articles and uh, collections of essays. A uh, colleague, uh, uh, Jonas Prita, uh, put out a collection a few years ago uh, called Conan Meets the Academy, and this was uh, one of the first uh, academic collections of essays on Conan in, in many, many years um, uh, since you know, The Dark Barbarian uh, back in the 1980s. Um, the, uh, the Weird Tales book was by uh, Rom uh, Roman and Littlefield, another academic trade press. And so uh, we were finally starting to make some inroads in that. It, just in the last few years, we started going to the uh, International Conference uh, for the Fantastic and the Arts, which is the, uh, the main international academic conference for science fiction, fantasy, and horror. And so it's a, it's a much more focused uh, concentration on this type of fiction. And we've been giving papers on Howard both in fantasy and in horror. Um, and so it, it's really started to pick up steam. And just our presence there uh, every year now and going to these conferences, we're now getting a seat at the table. You know, it may still be kind of a, a, a seat down at the corner of the table, <laughs> but we're, we're, we're there now and we're working our way up. And uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do when we started this last year was to uh, bring to Howard Days a little taste of some of the things that have been going on at these academic conferences. And that's what this Glenn Lord Symposium is all about. Uh, last year we had several, several presenters and uh, we're going to have three this year. This is the second year we've done it, the second year, uh, the second annual Glenn Lord Symposium here at Howard Days. And all of our presenters here are, are people that are, have been veterans of the, the conferences of the last couple of years and uh, very excited uh, to have them share some of their work with you. Um, just to, I'll give a brief introduction. You guys can 
uh, introduce yourselves a little bit more and talk about your specific research goals. Frank Hoffman uh, has been doing academic work on Howard uh, longer than anybody up here. Uh, he was uh, at one time the uh, editor of The Dark Man, the Journal of Robert E. Howard Studies, which is sort of the primary uh, academic journal, peer-reviewed journal uh, dedicated to, to Howard Studies. Um, you were part of that first contingent at PCA back in 2004, yeah. and he's been, been going, went back to PCA several times, Chicago, and now no ICFA. Range, yeah. um, and he's a professor of English at Rock Valley College in Rockville. Rock, Rock, Rock Ford, Ford. Illinois. Lots of rocks. Uh, <laughs> Illinois, yeah. um, a pro uh, professor of English there. And Dirk Gunter, um, we've already seen him a little bit uh, this weekend. He's uh, uh, a uh, English professor at Tokushima University in Japan. He is working on his, uh, completing his PhD with a dissertation on Robert E. Howard. And uh, Jason Ray Carney here for his first Howard days. Um, uh, Jason is a, a professor at Christopher Newport University in Virginia, a uh, professor of English. And uh, he, had a, he had a chapter in, in my Weird Tales book, and you can go to see Weird Tales. He's been going to PCA for a number of years now, and now ICFA. Um, so uh, these guys have some, some great presentations for you. So why don't we start with you, Frank? Sure. Um, Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably use this. Can yes, this? please okay. use the mics. I will. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do a, uh, I'm sure you'll appreciate an abbreviated form <laughs> of a, uh, I'm sorry? Put it up. There you go. Oh, okay. Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> that I can do. That I can do. An abbreviated uh, form of a, of a thing I did at the Chicago Popular Culture Association uh, convention in, uh, a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's uh, a thing I title, uh, Through a Glass Too Darkly, <laughs> uh, Conan Revealed as the Bright Barbarian. So uh, this is based upon a, a difference of opinion, I'll put it that way. But, but my basic initial argument is uh, following uh, Don Heron's uh, seminal anthology in, in 1984, Dark Barbarian, and the essay that he contributed to that same, uh, with that same title, uh, th there's been sort of a mantra among, not all, but, but many, at, at least at first most, and then many and at least still several Howard scholars that this is the correct picture of Conan and that uh, dark barbarism is the, is the center <laughs> of it all. <coughs> and of course, uh, Howard studies or Howard fandom for a long time, and maybe to some degree still is, uh, very Conan-centric. <laughs> and I have, I have several things about the, the character of Conan, or what I'm going to introduce as, well, not introduce, but suggest as really the characters of Conan. Uh, I see him as not just a complex character, or, or even as a complex character, but as a complex of characters. Uh, the stories uh, that we see, he, he's not the same person in every story. Uh, the one I'm going to focus on, uh, uh, The Devil in Iron, uh, he's more like Errol Flynn, <laughs> and uh, much more so than the savage that we see in the Frazetta, in the Frazetta covers, The Barbarian. So uh, this, that book, of course, The Dark Barbarian, uh, got its title from one, one stanza of a poem, A Word from the Outer Dark. Uh, for all the works of cultured man must fare and fade and fall. I am the dark barbarian that towers over all. And that, there's no question, I think, in, in reading Howard's, Howard's work that he, he does have, without doubt, the, the, the position that always civilizations will fall to, ultimately, to fall to barbarism. That there will be uh, a gradual erosion. The, the flip side of that, though, which I think Bob never quite maybe saw but didn't quite buy into, uh, one of my other main authors I, I like very much is G.K. Chesterton. <laughs> and it's sort of a glass half full, glass half empty <laughs> sort of difference. And not only does, do civilizations fall, but they rise again. <coughs> There are dark ages, but then those also diminish. So I see it more as a cyclical thing. Howard certainly was in the mindset that it was a case where, where the barbarian and the chaotic would eventually erode the civilized. But to say that the, the Conan character is the dark barbarian, I think goes too far. Uh, it's become, as I say, sort of a mantra among, <laughs> among many Howard fans. and. Uh, Especially, I, I base this on the correspondence between Howard and Lovecraft, 
<clears throat> where, where Robert Howard distinctly says and defines what he thinks a true barbarian is. And I think I can show that that's nowhere close to what Conan is, uh, or not as close as some might, might think. Uh, the, the correspondence, they had a, a long series of letters, and I'm talking about a long series of long <coughs> letters. These guys were writing, you know, 15, 20 page type letters to each other. So, and back and forth and on the same subject for months sometimes. And barbarism versus civilization was one of the, the main themes. But um, the barbarian uh, is, let's see, let's see, this is, uh, okay. Uh, he's, Howard describes him as uh, stark, primitive, ultimately benighted, dismally ignorant. These are some phrases from Howard. Uh, and Howard's most significant barbarian is not that, I will contend. So, uh, in the beginning of the, the Devil in Iron, the story I'm going to focus on just with a couple examples, uh, this is the description of the first character we see. Quite often in the Conan stories, Conan, and he most often, as a matter of fact, Conan is not the first character we see. He comes in, you know, after the, the, the play has begun. And it, the first character we see is, I think, what Howard would term a true barbarian. He's a Yuchi fisherman. He was broadly built with long apish arms and a mighty chest, but with lean loins and thin bandy legs. His face was broad, his forehead low and retreating, his hair thick and tangled. A belt for a knife and a rag for a loincloth were all he wore in the way of clothing. That he was where he was proved that he was less dully curious than most of his people. <laughs> the fisherman lusted for the weapon. He's seen a weapon in a magically appearing uh, sort of fortress that he's found. Uh, the man, of course, was dead, the man he's looking at. Well, the fisherman that we see in this is, is uh, this apish appearance, appearance the low brow. Uh, this is not the Conan we see. Um, in the letters, uh, Howard one point uh, says to, uh, uh, to Lovecraft, uh, writes to Lovecraft, that I don't think I could ever really show true barbarism in a story or nor do I think I will, I'm paraphrasing drastically here, <laughs> because, uh, because I don't know that it would sell. I don't know that it would be palatable to the reader. So if we really went by what Rob Howard think, thinks of uh, uh, barbarism, he never truly shows it, he holds it back. And his Conan, again, I contend is, is a different sort of uh, barbarian. Um, well, there are a couple of scenes uh, that I like to focus on from that story. He's described, uh, uh, there, there's one passage I'm, I'm quoting from the text. For an instant, the future, the future fate of kingdoms that hinged on, his, on this gay-clad barbarian hung in the balance. And, and that's true, the fate of kingdoms. The first time we see Conan, he's a king. Now, there are barbarian kings, but, but the, the story written not initially for, for Conan even, it was a, a replay, so to speak. In this story, The Devil in Iron, he's, he's very much like, uh, he's, he's dressed in pantaloons and a, an open white linen shirt, uh, a headband, a bandana, carrying a scimitar. <laughs> and it, it's very much like Errol Flynn from the swashbuckling movies. That, that's a different vision of Conan, and the, pictures on, the picture on the cover of Weird Tales is exactly that sort of image, too. This is not the Conan that most people envision or see from the, the typical Frisetta, uh, Frisetta uh, show. The, uh, this is uh, somebody in the story. Uh, presently she spoke, this beautiful, of course beautiful uh, damsel that he's encountered, but the tongue was unfamiliar to him and he shook his head. She yawned again, stretched lithely and without any show of fear or surprise, shifted to a language he did understand a dialect of Yuchi which sounded strangely archaic. Conan the linguist? <laughs> uh, it's like he knows archaic versions of languages. Uh, pretty well studied barbarian. The, uh, there's a, uh, a, a, a scene where he sees, Conan knew uh, some friezes on the wall of a, of a palace. It was not a clever copy, but the skin of an actual beast. That beast, Conan knew, had been extinct for at least a thousand years. Conan, the archaeologist, anthropologist. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a well-studied barbarian. Uh, 
he, he's familiar with the book of Skelos, so literate, Conan the librarian, he talks about the librarian, that, you know, there are, there are several things that, uh, if, you, if you look at the body of the stories, uh, we see a character that in many is consistent and the typical one that most people envision, but by no means as benighted or as oafish or, or primitive or unenlightened as, as the, uh, the barbarian that he talks about, as the true barbarian. The other reasons, there are several. The, the, the Lovecraft letters with uh, Howard are, are significant. The other reasons that I would state as the biggest ones, uh, in addition, uh, I mentioned the fact that Conan, is, I see as a, a complex of different characters. The letter exchanges, the, the recognition that R.E.H. himself says, I, I don't think I could ever write about a true barbarian. I'm not sure it'd sell or be palatable. But the other uh, final thing I'd mention is uh, heroes in any story have to be better than the villains. <laughs> and so th this is sort of a, a universal convention in most fiction. Uh, I had a great professor at Northern Illinois who had been at Minnesota for many years, uh, Martin Steinman, and he has the convention theory that he calls superordinate genre conventions. He would probably call this the, the convention that would read, heroes must be better than villains rule. <laughs> in other words, he has to be uh, the best person in his world at least better than the truly barbaric, like that Yuchi fisherman that we saw in that story. He's uh, many legs up on the, on the truly barbaric enemies he encounters. So, you know, he's a king, he's, he seems to be educated, he's literate, he knows plural languages. When, he, when he's pressed, he acts and can act very barbaric, but uh, the idea that fighting without fear, there are civilized people that can do that too, or in spite of fear. You know, most of the markers that Conan shows are, would be heroic in any civilized situation. So, the end of the story basically, but I just wanted to throw those things out as the, the basis of my theory. He's nowhere near as dark uh, in really any of the stories, maybe a couple he approaches it, but uh, pretty much brighter than, than the, the other uh, vision would maintain. And I, I think that, uh, that that initial thought from Heron of the dark barbarian needs to be modified or looked at or at least debated, and that's kind of where I am. Thanks.